All right. Uh, Acts chapter 12, and we're going to look at the first half of this chapter this morning. I did not mention earlier, but um, this afternoon I, w I was preaching down in Wellsford, Mount, uh, the Mount Zion Mission, but I've recorded the sermon, and so I'll also be preaching up here, all right? And so, uh, interesting uh, way of doing it. I preached the last half first a couple days ago, all right? So, hopefully I don't miss any points in between, and, you know, I don't get too long on one point, and you, you miss the middle. But anyway, um, if not, we'll just have to repeat next week, amen? Anyway, all right. So, Acts chapter 12, we're going to look at the first uh, part of this chapter, and this is probably a familiar account to, to many of us. Uh, this is where the Apostle Peter is delivered from prison. Let, let's go ahead and read, uh, starting in verse 1. It says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel, and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when, he saw, and when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was so, even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, begging unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. And we'll stop our reading uh, this morning there. But here we had this wonderful account. Uh, and a lot of it is historical uh, in the sense it just gives us a lot of details, a lot of facts. There's some humor in it too, amen? You know, God has a sense of humor. And uh, obviously, uh, we're, we're sometimes just like these believers, aren't we? God does what we ask him to do, and then we don't believe he's done it. And uh, we, we find ourselves in that situation that we just can't accept the fact that God really did what we asked, amen? But God is good, and he does answer prayer. But I, I want us to just go through this, and there's a lot of you know, lessons to be learned. I'm sure that I'm not going to exhaust the scripture this morning, but I just want to point, point out a few things, all right? And hopefully that the, the Lord will use it uh, to encourage us and help us uh, and, and learn from this uh, prayer meeting that took place and then how God answered and how God worked through those that were uh, praying. We see several things here, seven things, and it's not going to take, not, not every point's going to be quite as long, all right? But seven points, all right? We see the persecution that come about. We see Peter's in prison. We see the petition that was made. We see uh, the prisoner, Peter, in, in prison. Uh, we see the protector that God sent, the angel. We see the providence of God. And then we see the praise of God. And what I think God is trying to teach us, uh, one thing he's trying to teach us from, from this scripture is that we must pray earnestly if we desire to answer, for God to answer our prayers. And then we must praise him eagerly when he does. You know, oftentimes we will pray uh, earnestly and we, we want God to work and we're, we're desperate. And when he answers, we forget it. 
and we don't share the blessing. Hey, we ought to be just as excited to share what God has done after the fact as we were as we were eager to see Him work beforehand. Amen. And so hopefully uh, we can learn from this example, and uh, God will use this today in each one of our lives. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Lord, we thank you for this morning, and Lord, I thank you for how you've blessed this day already. I thank you for the, the good Sunday school hour, and Lord, I pray that you would now bless as uh, your word goes forth. Uh, Lord, there's nothing that I have to say that is going to be of a help, or uh, Lord, uh, can, can meet any needs this morning. But as the word of God goes forth, I pray that you would give me clarity of thought. You would fill me with your spirit, and Lord, that you would help me to say exactly what you want me to say, that Lord, the Holy Spirit would convict using the word of God, and Lord, would apply, uh, Lord, your truth to our hearts, and that Lord, it would change us, it would make us into, Lord, what you'd have us to be, Lord, the image of your dear son. I pray, you'd, Lord, uh, do your work, encourage, Lord, rebuke, whatever the need is in each life, may you have your way this morning, we'll give you praise and honor for it, in Jesus' name we ask these things, amen. Well, we already see kind of the setting, all right, in, in verse 1, but we see what, what's going on here. Um, and towards the, the end of the chapter, it, it mentions uh, about Saul and Barnabas some. The end of chapter 11 is speaking about Saul and Barnabas, and so this fits right into that time period. It says, now about that time, what time? Well, the end of chapter 11 talks about the revival going on in Antioch, and we just looked at that last week, all right, how that Barnabas had went so far as to Antioch, and it seemed that Gentiles were getting saved up there. The church at Jerusalem sent him there to investigate that, and lo and behold, that's exactly what was going on. Uh, then he goes to Tarsus and has Saul, who's been kind of waiting there and hiding because the Jews wanted to kill him. Now Barnabas says, hey, Gentiles are getting saved, and that's what God called you. He put a call on your life to reach Gentiles. So they come back to Antioch, and they've been there for probably about a year. And then this famine comes upon the whole region. It says the entire world. And the saints there in Antioch send a gift to the church at Jerusalem. And they do that by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So they arrive right in town just in time for the execution of Peter. And that's what's going on. Now about that time, about the time this famine was going on, and that they received this gift there in Jerusalem, Peter is in prison getting ready to be executed. Now, um, you know, the, the situation here with, with Herod, and it says that he had killed James, uh, the brother of John, with the sword, and he saw it please the Jews. Now, this is not Herod the Great. This would be his, I believe it's his grandson. Um, this is the only Herod. It was called Herod the King. Uh, Herod the Great was the one who uh, built the temple there, all right, just, just prior to Christ's life, and then, uh, of course, the temple remained standing uh, during Christ's ministry. So this would be his grandson. Uh, there's two or three Herods there, all right? And so uh, this Herod, uh, he is not well liked by the Jews. Um, they, they despise him. Uh, he is a descendant of Esau, so he's not Jewish, and yet he's there reigning over them. He's been placed there by the Romans. Uh, he's there. His authority comes from Rome. And when the Jews recognized that they could not persecute the church on their own, meaning that they lost Saul of Tarsus. I remember Saul's conversion in Acts chapter 9. He was on his way to kill Christians to the, on the road to Damascus, and God blinded him and he got saved. Well, the, the reason they wanted to kill Saul was because he did 180 degrees. Amen. We just talked about Sunday school. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Uh, Saul of Tarsus became Paul. Amen. Paul the apostle. And uh, he went from persecuting Christians to preaching. And so God totally changed his life. These Jews that were totally behind him and encouraging him to go kill these Christians, now they had no one else that would go do that. No one else was that brave. No one else was that bold. And now, if they couldn't do it themselves, they turned to the Roman government. And just like they pinned the crucifixion of Jesus upon Rome, they said that, well, we'll let Rome take care of the Christians. And Herod was more than happy to do that. If he could kill off a few Christians and keep the Jews happy with himself and, and, and keep them, you know, pacified, so to speak, then all would be good. And that's exactly what he started doing then. He just started killing off the Christians. He figured, if I could get rid of this little Christian sect that's, you know, it's kind of competing with Judaism, and the Jews will be happy in me doing that, hey, that's a win-win situation. They're happy, I'm happy, and we get rid of these, these troublemakers called Christians. So that's what he's attempting to do here. 
and he's locked up Peter in prison. Now, we see that, uh, that the third thing here, uh, the petition was made. Uh, down, down in verse <clears throat> uh, 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but, but prayer was made without ceasing. Yeah, praise the Lord for the buts of the Bible. Uh, that there's, there's a time when, when God just comes in and intervenes, amen? And that's exactly what happens here. Uh, things are looking really bad for Peter. Things are looking bad for the church, but prayer was made. Why did God intervene? Why did God come in and, and, and just disturb the whole thing and change everything? Because prayer was made, amen? Prayer changes things. Prayer gets God's attention. That's exactly what the church did here. It says prayer was made without ceasing of the church. It's interesting, that phrase, without ceasing. It's a word of intense prayer. The only, the only other time that, that Greek word is used in our New Testament is by Peter himself in uh, 1 Peter 4, 8, which it, it's there, he uses it speaking about love and charity. He says, above all things, have fervent charity. Speaking of intense charity, intense love. Now, there, there's a, uh, a similar word um, that's used in Luke's gospel, and it's there speaking of our Lord in Gethsemane. And Luke says that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. That's the kind of praying they were doing here for Peter. It was intense. It was, I mean, it was, this isn't just now lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord of my soul to keep. This was intense prayer. This was probably physically exhausting. When, when they got done, they felt tired. And it wasn't because they just hadn't slept much. They were emotionally and physically involved and calling out to God and asking for God to move on Peter's behalf. Uh, they, they were desperate for God to do something. And so this was intense praying. We see the petition that was made. We see Peter's in prison. The next verse, it begins to describe Peter. It says, uh, Peter, in the middle part of the verse, that same night, the very night before he was to be executed, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, <clears throat> bound with two chains. The keeper before the door kept the prison. Up in verse 4, we see it says that he was delivered unto four quarterings of soldiers. Now, quarterin, uh, it, you know, it speaks of the number four, or a quarter, all right? And that's, that's exactly what it is. It was the night watch. There were 16 soldiers that would have a round. And so you had two soldiers that would be outside the door of, of Peter's prison. And then you had two that were inside chained to Peter. And so you had four guards uh, all together. Uh, and then they would take a turn. And I believe it would be about every two or three hours they would rotate. They were taking a, a, a round. And so all together it would be 16 soldiers. That uh, would be four, four and four. So every four hours they would rotate. All right? And they would do that, or if it were a Jewish calendar, would be from a 12-hour calendar, so it would be three, every three hours, they would rotate the four soldiers out, all right? So um, something like that, all right? Um, I'm not a good mathematician, all right, especially on the spot. But uh, roughly 16 soldiers that rotate every three or four hours guarding Peter. Uh, Peter's not getting out of this thing on his own, all right? Remember, Peter's not a bodybuilder. Peter's a fisherman, you know, and... Um, uh, he's not been doing that lately. The past 30, 30, 40 years or so, he's just been preaching. All right? Now, I'm not saying that you know, preachers shouldn't be physically fit. All right? But I'm, I'm saying that Peter's not going to take four Roman guards. And uh, especially if there's eight more, uh, or you know, there's several more waiting just for the next shift. Okay? It's not going to happen. Uh, Peter's not getting out of this thing on his own. And yet we see that Peter is fast asleep. <coughs> Now, if you knew that you were losing your head, literally, the next morning, would you be sleeping that night? Peter is. Remember, Peter was told by the Lord Jesus just before he ascended that he was going to give his life for the, for the gospel. Peter knew that martyrdom was his fate. And no doubt he assumed that this was it. There was no getting out. Now, the church, they didn't, they, they want to see Peter carry on. They didn't want to see Peter go right now. But they, they wanted Peter to continue on. They needed Peter. And you know that they, they did need Peter because the Lord delivered Peter. Amen. But Peter, he was totally at peace. 
If this is it, Lord, this is it. I'm, it's okay. He's asleep in the prison the night before he's to be executed. It's interesting um, here, the, uh, the word for prison, uh, verse 5, it has the idea of being a, an abode, being settled. Again, the, the, whole, the whole word picture here in verses 5 and 6 is just that of being at peace and acceptance. You know, sometimes when we face a, a situation, and hopefully not as dire as Peter was in, but when we face trying situations and we're asking God to do the impossible, um, we have to be willing to accept God saying no. That's what Peter's done here. Now, Peter's going to see a miracle. Peter's going to be walked out by his guardian angel under the hand of Herod and 16 soldiers. And even the church won't believe it. He's getting ready, he's getting ready to witness a miracle. But he's accepted the fact that God might say no and just take him home. He's totally at peace. You know, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 tell us, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And then, verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which passes understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We get that reversed. We want to make the prayer, and then if God answers the way we like it, we'll praise Him, and then we'll have peace. God says it doesn't work that way. You praise me no matter how I answer. And you pray anyway, no matter what it looks like. And when you give it over to me in prayer, then I'll give you peace. We have to be willing to accept that God might say no. That's exactly what Peter's done here. He's, he's just resolved, resigned it over to the Lord. He says, Lord, whatever you want, I'm in your hands. Now, did Peter want to die that night? I really doubt it. Okay, But he has given it over to the Lord. He is at total peace here. He's settled in his heart and mind, uh, no matter what the Lord does. But then we see that the angel of the Lord does come. And verse 7, Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. Now, Again, if I'm in prison the night before I'm supposed to die, I don't think I'd be asleep. Peter's not just dozing off because he's worried himself to sleep out of anxiety. He is gone. <laughs> I mean, it's like he's been up waiting for a baby to be born. And Jared knows what that feels like. <laughs> he, he, is, he is totally gone. He is fast asleep. And the angel comes in. A bright light shines. The light doesn't wake him up. The angel has to smack him on the side of the head and say, Hey, we're getting out of here. We're busting out of here. <laughs> that, that's how well he was. That's how you know, much at peace he was. And there was no um, you know, turmoil in his heart and his mind that uh, he could not get a good night's sleep. He was fast asleep. And the angel wakes him up, smokes him. And interesting how the angel then says, Arise up quickly. And it didn't wake the soldiers up. Didn't wake them up. Uh, <clears throat> his chains fell off. And then the angel says, verse 8, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And then uh, he says, Cast thy garment about thee, follow me. You know, one person, is, and this is not uh, one of the main points, but there's a, there's a lesson here, all right? Uh, the angel gives him very specific instructions what he's supposed to do. He, he tells him to stand up. Uh, can, uh, let's see, uh, gird thyself, bind thy sandals on, get your shoes on. Uh, we're going out the door. But you know, he first took his chains off. Peter could have done all that if his chains were still on. You know, if God's giving you something to do, he's going to first of all remove the chains so you're able to do it. Okay? God is going to enable you. Uh, God will always enable you to do what he's called you to do. That's exactly what God did for Peter here. Peter, he couldn't have put his coat on, got his sandals on, if he still had chains on his, on his wrist. And so the angel freed him, and then he was able to do what he was commanded to do. And, of course, he obeys. Uh, he he's, uh, puts his uh, stuff on, and they're going out. Uh, we see this protector then, all right, uh, here in uh, verses 7 and 8. And let's look down in verse, uh, verse 9. It says, He went out and followed him, Wist not that it was true 
which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. Again, Peter was so much asleep, he thought he thinks he's dreaming. He thinks he's dreaming. Uh, they go through the first, second ward, verse 10. They came into the iron gate, and then, the end of verse 10, when they got into the street, uh, the angel departed. And verse 11, when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and all the expectation of the Jews. Here, it, it comes to full reality for Peter. He is really outside the prison. Yet, walking through those first two words, he may have just thought it was a dream. And then they stand, he stands before the, the final gate and it just opens. And that's, that's miraculous. I mean, this, this wouldn't have been just some simple wooden door. This is probably some heavy iron you know, gate. And it just comes open naturally. No, no guards need to open this for him. It just comes wide open. God's hand just pushes it open for him. And the angel leads him right on out. Again, he still thinks he's dreaming. And he gets out into the street. And the angel's gone. And I'm really out here. It was, I thought I saw an angel. I thought, I was in, how did, how did I do that? What happened? I'm really out here. And he says he comes to his senses. He, it, it, it's like he just, he wakes up. That's what that means there. It says, uh, uh, verse 11, he come to himself. Then it means it just, he realized exactly what was going on. And he says, now I know of a surety. The Lord has sent his angel. And I've, I've already kind of uh, mentioned it, but many believe that this was Peter's guardian angel. And that, that's kind of a, a whole other message, but um, the Bible does teach that believers have a guardian angel. Now, some people say, well, that's just an, an allusion to Christ. He's watching over us. But that's not necessarily true. Okay, We know that the Christ dwells in us as the Holy Spirit in the third person of the Trinity. He is always with us. But the Bible also says that we attend angels unaware and that they watch over us and that they, they care for us. Now, uh, you say, Pastor, have you ever seen an angel? Not that I know of. Okay? Um, I may have had some close encounters, especially when I'm driving. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I've never seen them. All right? Yeah, the old saying, don't, don't drive faster than your angel can fly. <laughs> I've tested that a few times, but anyway. <laughs> you know, um, that's why Amy drives, the, drives down to Wellsford. Anyway, uh, the Bible teaches, and it doesn't tell us a whole lot about it, okay, because we're not to focus upon angelic beings, all right? We're not to worship them, of course, but God uses them as his servants, as uh, ministers, and they guard us in some way, you know? I have no doubt that there are angels here this morning watching over our service, but we can't see them. By the way, guess what? There's probably some spiritual darkness here, too watching over. This is a battleground this morning for your heart, for your soul. And, and the devil doesn't uh, just you know, blow that off as well. It's just another time to go into church. No, the word of God is going forth. He's going to make sure that he's here to distract you. And guess what? God is here to make sure that you are tuned in. He wants you to be hearing what God has to say, what he has to say to you, what the word of God is going to uh, say to you this morning. And so uh, there are spiritual forces that work around us, all right? Now, uh, you say, Pastor, why you just open up a whole lot of questions? I understand, right? You have to, we'll have to come back for another message on that, all right? That's a whole other topic. But here we see this angel delivered Peter. And that, that happens in some way that we don't understand even today, all right? Uh, and, and the spiritual warfare and, and the spiritual realm of things that are unseen to the human eye, all right? But um, we see then Peter, he, he makes this, this statement. He says, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from the, all the expectation of the Jews. Uh, first of all, we see uh, about this an expectation. And th this is speaking of this hatred that the Jews had. That the Jews were, were hungry to see the Christians executed. That they wanted to see Christians stamped out. That they knew that if Judaism was to survive, Christianity had to go. It could not have both. You couldn't have these people believing 
that this man named Jesus was the real Messiah and he really performed miracles, that he rose from the dead, and that he now has called them, called people to believe in him rather than to follow the teachings of the law in the Old Testament and the worship of the temple and pay tithes and offerings. The two could not coexist. And so they were eager, they were hungry to see these leaders of this cult, they would say, executed and gotten rid of. And Peter, he says, I know that God has sent his angel to deliver me from the expectation of the Jews and from Herod, the hand of Herod. So uh, not only was there an expectation that was, that was not met, that went unmet, amen, but then there was evidence that he, that he offered. Verse 12, he says, When he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And now, uh, those individuals mentioned there will be significant towards the end of the chapter, and uh, point that out more so tonight, all right? But uh, Mary and then John Mark. But uh, verse 13, as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. I had a pastor friend just this morning. We were talking, and he said, what you preaching on today? And I told him I was preaching on this text. And he said, oh, yeah, is that that, is that, that uh, passage where they had that prayer meeting and they had that blonde, blonde girl at the door? I said, did you get that in the Greek? <laughs> we don't know what color her hair was, all right? But um, another preacher friend, he says, remember that blonde is a, st a state of mind, not a hair color. Okay, so if you've got, if you've got blonde hair, it's, it doesn't necessarily seep in, okay? All right. So um, for whatever reason, Rhoda's at the door here, and verse 14, she saw, she knew Peter's voice. She opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. She didn't let it, she didn't even open the door. She said, nah, I just... I just thought, Wendy, you're here this morning. I hope I didn't upset you. I just thought about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wendy, you know me well enough. I hope I didn't upset you. <laughs> All right. Oh. So <clears throat> here, here, is, here is Rhoda, and for whatever reason, okay, it wasn't her hair color, okay, she, she did not let Peter in. She's excited. You know what the Bible tells us why? For gladness. Uh, she didn't open the gate. And she told how Peter stood at the gate. She went in. Now, verse 15, she, she said unto them, Peter's at the door. They said, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. And then they said, It's his angel. Now, <clears throat> they must have assumed, Well, Peter's already died. He didn't make it to the execution block. He died in prison. And now his angel has come to visit us. And she says, no, no, it's not an angel. It's really Peter. It's really him. She keeps, she's persistent about this thing. You know, the point I want to make here, verse 16, Peter kept knocking. And finally, of course, they come to the door. But Peter recognized that when God answered their prayers, he needed to show the evidence. I mean, at daybreak, he's going to be a wanted man. He has escaped the hand of Herod. He has escaped 16 soldiers. He has escaped uh, the Jewish, you know, the, the Jews of Jerusalem, and he's going to be the number one wanted man in, in the morning. He needs to get out of town. He needs to be hiding somewhere. And verse 17 says he does, all right? But for right now, he's going to go tell the church what God's done. You know, when, when God answers our prayers, we need to share that. We need to praise God when he delivers us. Let's let the world know, amen? Let's not hide that in, in, in a corner. Let's let the world know. Let's share God's goodness. About once a quarter, once every three months or so, on our Wednesday night prayer meetings, we'll take the time and just have a praise service. And that's what we, we, I try to do that often. And what is that? We just take the opportunity, and we don't take a lot of requests that night. And say, let's just talk about what God has already answered. Let's just talk about what God's goodness. And, and let's just let's focus upon praising God tonight rather than asking for a lot of things. Because again, so many times we get focused on we need this and God, you've got to do this and God, if you don't come through. And all that is true. And all that's right. And God, he wants us to call out to him. But in the midst of all the asking, we, don't need, to, we need to stop and remember everything he's already done. Amen. And praise him for what he's done. Uh, Peter's troubles weren't over. They were just getting started. <laughs> the, 
But he was going to stop and give praise and testify to the other believers of what God had done. And so he goes and he shows evidence of what God has done in delivering him. Amen. And so we see then in, uh, let's go down to verse 15. All right. They, they told, uh, wrote thou art mad. And they said, it's his angel. Verse 16, Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he beckoned unto them with the hand to hold their peace because of how that the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go, show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. We see that, uh, again, uh, they were kind of rebuked because they didn't believe that God had done what they were asking for. How, how many times do we <clears throat> not accept what God's done is just it's too good to believe. It's too good to be true. You know, our, uh, our pessimistic mindset sometimes, we can't accept the fact that God really did answer our prayer. That it's really true. That's, that's how these believers work. We need to accept when God has, has really done something. Amen? And accept it uh, as legit. But then we see they're rejoicing. All right? In verses 16 and 17. It says they were astonished. And... Then uh, he beckoned them to hold their peace. He declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Wouldn't you love to have been in that prayer meeting? To be a part of that earnest praying. Prayer was made unceasingly. I mean, th th they're probably doing some fasting. Th they're just intensely praying for Peter. There is no way he's getting out. And they've been praying now for several hours. And we don't know what time of the, you know, in the night that it was. But you get to that those early morning hours or whatever, and all of a sudden you hear this. Who is that? It's not the night. Is it guards? Maybe there's, maybe there's soldiers. Maybe they, they want us now. I'm in! That sounds like Peter. That's not Peter's voice. We've been up too long. We're so focused on Peter. We're here in Peter. <laughs> it can't be Peter. He's locked up downtown. There's no way. Hey! Hey! Rhoda! Rhoda, let me in! It's Peter! How is that nun? Man, it's, it's late. It's, it's early. It's, <laughs> it's the middle of the night. Making their round, and, and you just you just walked out between those four soldiers. Yeah, and the angel led you out. Yeah, and you got to the main gate, and just he said, just opened up. I don't know how I did it. He said, I thought I was dreaming. Then I was out, I was in the middle of the street, and it was gone. The angel was gone, and I, I'm here. Just, yeah, just, wow, what a testimony. Amen. What an awesome story. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just for them, though. Amen. What did Peter tell them to do? Notice here in verses 16 and 17, it says, When they saw him, they were astonished. You know, when God delivers us, again, we need to show the evidence. Let people see what God has done. Amen. They saw him. They were astonished. And then, not only did he show them what God had done, he, that they saw him physically, then he said, I want you to share it. He declared unto them everything that God had done that night. And then, the last thing here, he said, go show these things unto James and all the brethren. He told them to spread the news. He said, hey, you go tell the whole church, <laughs> I'm free. God did it. God released it. God got me out of the hand of got me out from under the hand of Herod. God has saved me from the expectation of the Jews who hate us. God has brought deliverance to me. 
and to all of us for that matter. Hey, you go share the news. You know, when God does some incredible things, that's what we need to do. Let's, let's be as eager to share what God has done as we are to pray for what God, what we want God to do. Amen? We can get so worked up and so nervous and be anxious. And, and even, in, even in praying, we're praying in the flesh and just out of worry rather than just giving it over to God. And instead, we just need to let those requests be made known unto God and let the peace of God rule in our hearts. Amen? And then, when God does answer the prayer, we need to praise Him and let the world know, hey, this is what my God can do. Hey, this is how my God can deliver. This is what great things God has done. That's what God desires, is for us to praise Him. Amen? And let God uh, have the glory. Amen? In our lives. That's what Peter did. That's what the church of Jerusalem did. And I know some of you may not be able to be here tonight, but I'll just give you a tidbit, a tidbit all right, of information tonight. The young man here, uh, John, back in verse 12, whose surname was Mark, is the man who eventually would write the Gospel of Mark. What an interesting connection that, and there's a lot of other things that are God's going to use in his life to bring together, but God will use the testimony of individuals like Peter and Paul and Barnabas and others to then help a young man named Mark under inspiration of the Holy Spirit piece together the gospel and leave it for us for all eternity to read in the Word of God. See, you never know how God will use your testimony. You never know how God will use. You say, it's not that important to really tell others what God has done. Well, yes, it is. God inhabits the praise of his people. God wants us to lift him up. God wants us to testify of his goodness. Amen. And God will use your testimony and, and what your answer to prayer, how you share that with someone else to lift them up and, and help them keep the faith, so to speak. Amen. Hey, we need to praise the Lord. Are you praising him for what he's done? Are you calling out to him? You say, Pastor, I haven't really seen God do much lately in my life. Maybe it's because you haven't called out to him lately and asked for his help. Hey, we need to call out to him, amen? We need to be praying that God will meet those needs. Sometimes God puts us in those impossible situations just so we'll call out to him, amen? It's not because it's too impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. But he wants us to praise him. And he says, child, if you're not going to praise me without the problems, I want you to praise me in the problems. Amen. Let's just vow to praise the Lord regardless of what happens. Amen. And God will get the glory. And God will use us to glorify his name and, and share the truth with the lost world. Let's close the word of prayer.